Let us pray. Our loving Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of approaching your throne, not in our merits, but in the powerful merits of your Son, Jesus Christ. As we look at the world, we see so many things that are going wrong, so much evil, so much crime, so many natural disasters. And this has led people to say, where is God? I ask, Father, that as we study the answer to this very important question, that you will guide us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit. Help us to understand the message of the book of Job, a story that not only has past relevance, but future relevance as well. And we thank you for hearing our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The book of Job is the most ancient book of the Bible. It is actually a literary masterpiece. It was written by Moses approximately 1,500 years before Jesus was born. But it actually tells the story of a patriarch who lived about 500 years before Moses wrote the book in the early patriarchal age. The book is composed, first of all, of prose, the first two chapters. And then from chapter 3 all the way through chapter 42, verse 7, it's written in poetry. And finally, in chapter 42 and verse 8 through verse 17, once again it returns to prose. Now this book has confused many theologians. There are many ideas on the purpose of this book. Some say that the purpose of the book is to answer the question, why do the righteous suffer? Some also say that the purpose of the book is to teach us to be firm and constant in the midst of suffering. Now there's no doubt that these issues are included in the story of Job. But the story is much deeper than just why do the righteous suffer, or the need to persevere in the midst of suffering. What's taking place in the book of Job is really a trial. It is a trial that is taking place in heaven, interestingly enough. And it really foreshadows the investigative judgment that is taking place now in heaven. If you look carefully at this story, you're going to find that there is an accuser who is Satan. There is a defense attorney who is Jesus or God. There is a judge who sits on his throne. There is a jury, they're called the sons of God. Evidence is examined. There are accusations. And there are responses to those accusations. And we'll notice that at the end of the story, there is a final verdict. This book is saturated with legal language. In other words, it is to be understood in a judicial context. It is actually a trial that is taking place in heaven, believe it or not. Let me give you one verse as an example of the legal language that is used in the book. And I have in the written material many more texts from Job that use legal uh, or judicial language. Notice Job 16 and verse 19. Here Job is speaking to God and he says, Surely even now... My witness is in heaven, and my evidence is on high. Witness and evidence, language of a court of law. 
Now it's very important for us to remember that there was no written revelation when this story took place. None of the books of the Bible had actually been written yet. So Job did not have all of the information that we have today that helps us know what's going on in the invisible world. In fact, we're going to notice in this story that heaven knows what is happening on earth, but earth does not know what is happening in heaven. And if Job had had scripture and he had known, his trial would have been much easier for him to bear. Now the scene in Job begins on earth. It's kind of like a drama. The curtain opens and we're on earth. And Job is introduced in chapter 1 and verses 1 to 3. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Many children in biblical times were a sign of God's blessing. But he not only had many children, because it continues saying also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. Job was a very rich and prosperous man. But he was also a very spiritual man, a strange combination indeed rich but spiritual. Notice Job chapter 1 and verse 1 and then we'll read verse 4 and 5, verses 4 and 5 and also verse 8. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job and that man was, listen to his character, was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. And you know, I, I read this because some theologians say that Job was an arrogant individual, self-sufficient. Scripture does not sustain that view. Now notice what it says in verse 4. And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each on his appointed day, probably on their birthday, and would send and invite their sisters, their three sisters, to eat and drink with them. So it was when the days of feasting had run their course that Job would send and sanctify them. Notice he was a family man. He was interested in the spiritual welfare of his family. So it says Job would send and sanctify them. And he would rise early in the morning and offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Verse 8, then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Now as God is saying, have you looked at my servant who lives down in your territory? That there is none like him on earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Now notice here that it is God who is speaking. In the introduction to the book, it's simply being recorded that he was this. But here it's saying that God is saying this about his servant Job. That he was blameless, upright, feared God, and shunned evil. Job was also a very generous man, a philanthropic man. He used his possessions to bless others. Notice Job 29 verses 12 through 17. Job 29 verses 12 through 17. Here Job is describing what he used his riches for. Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless and the one who had no helper. The blessing of a perishing man came upon me and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness and it clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and I searched out the case that I did not know. I broke the, broke the fangs of the wicked and plucked the victim from his teeth. Was he a generous man? 
Oh yes, very philanthropic, rich, spiritual, generous. Now let's go to chapter 1 and verse 6. The curtain closes on the earthly scene, the stage is rearranged, and now the curtain opens and we are in heaven. Job chapter 1 verse 6, God is entertaining a dialogue with Satan. And it says there, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. The sons of God, I don't have time to get into it, but the sons of God are the representatives of the worlds that never sinned. Each world has a representative in the heavenly council. And so it says, now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. The reason Satan came among them is because he had stolen Adam's position as the representative of this world when Adam allowed himself to be conquered. Verse 7, And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, that is, from, from patrolling my territory, and from walking back and forth on it. And then God, perhaps with a touch of healthy pride, says in verse 8, Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? He lives in your territory, but he's my servant. That there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. Have you seen my servant? Even though he lives in your territory, he fears me, and he loves me, and he obeys me. And now in Job chapter 1, verses 9 through 11, Satan challenges God. And these are perhaps some of the most important verses in the whole book. Satan challenges God, and he says, Does Job serve you because he loves you? Or does Job serve you for the loaves and fishes? Would Job love and serve you even if ever everything went wrong? Let's read it. Job chapter 1 and verse 9. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? In other words, would Job serve you even if he didn't have anything that you have given to him? Have you, now notice, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? In other words, you put a fence around him. I have no access to him. You bless him, you have bought his allegiance. You know, there's this fundamental misconception about the book of Job, and that is that the devil was accusing Job. The devil was not accusing Job, he was accusing God. And you can't understand the theology of the book unless you understand that the accusation of Satan is primarily against God. Because he's saying, Job serves you for the loaves and fishes, he loves you and he fears you because of everything that you've given him, but he would not serve you if everything disappeared. So he serves you because you have been good to him. He continues saying there, You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land, but now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has and he will surely curse you to your face. All heaven is listening to this conversation. Heaven is watching what is happening. And they're asking themselves, is it true what Satan is accusing God of? That Job serves God because God has put a hedge around him and God is good to him, 
Does Job serve God only because of the blessings that he has received? Oh, we wonder. So God says, you wonder? I'll tell you what you can do. Notice verse 12. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has in, is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. The devil says, Oh, goody, goody! I'm going to prove that Job serves God because God is good to him. And so the curtain closes. The stage is rearranged and the curtain opens and now we're on earth again. And what happens on earth is truly calamitous. The Bible tells us that the Sabaeans, a tribe of desert-like people, came and stole all of Job's oxen and donkeys and killed his servants. Then fire falls from heaven and burns up the sheep and the servants. The Chaldeans come and they steal all of the camels and kill all of the servants. A mighty wind comes and collapses the house where all of his children are gathered together and all of his children perish. Now this did not take place over the course of several days. Because the story tells us that while one individual was giving the report, the other one was coming and giving his report about the calamity that had taken place. This takes place within a period of minutes. He's lost all of his possessions and he has lost all of his children. He's lost ox, oxen, donkeys, sheep, camels, servants, children. He is totally bankrupt. How did Job react? Job 1 verses 20 to 22. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground and worshipped. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. He was half right. <laughs> the Lord gave, but the Lord did not take away. But he didn't know. He had no written revelation. Very important. So he says, The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The devil had said, he'll curse you. He says, blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. And I can imagine the heavenly council saying, yes! God is right. Job serves God because he loves him. And look at that old devil. He took everything from him. And Job still fears and serves God and loves him with all of his heart. God is right. And Satan is wrong. Is all heaven starting to catch a glimpse of the difference between God and Satan? Absolutely. This is a universal controversy. All eyes are riveted upon the earth. That's why 1 Corinthians 4, 9 says that earth is the theater of the universe, both before men and before angels. All the universe is watching. The curtain closes. The stage is rearranged. And the curtain opens again, and now we are once again in heaven. Another council is taking place. Let's read about it in Job chapter 2, verses 1 to 3. Again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. In other words, from patrolling my territory, which Adam gave to me. Now I think God, with a touch of extra pride, says, have you considered my servant Job? 
that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil, and still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. God is saying what you, what you did is absurd. There's no reason for it. But Satan has an argument in his mouth. Job chapter 2 and verses 4 and 5. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. All heaven is listening and watching. So the heavenly council say, hmm, true, he lost everything, all of his possessions, he lost all of his children, but really God didn't allow Satan to touch him. Notice what we find in chapter 2 and verse 6. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. The curtain closes. The stage is rearranged. The curtain opens. And now we are on earth again. Chapter 2 and verses 7 and 8. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd, that's a part of a piece of pottery, with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of ashes. So now he's lost his health. And he's about to lose the support of his wife, who becomes the devil's tempter. An instrument in the devil's hands to tempt Job. Notice chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Who had said that Job was going to curse God? Satan. So she is an instrument of whom? Of Satan to try and convince Job to curse God. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. See, there's wise women and there's foolish women. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? In all this Job did not sin with his lips. Once again, Job is only half right because he says, shall we accept from good from God and also adversity from God? Well, God doesn't send adversity. But Job doesn't know. This is a very important detail to understand this book. Job does not know. His knowledge is incomplete. His knowledge is partial. He doesn't know what we know today from reading Scripture. And then Job is going to lose his best friends. His three best friends come to console him, and the book tells us that they become his accusers. Notice chapter 2 and verses 11 to 13. Job chapter 2, verses 11 to 13, it says, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place, Eliphaz the Temanite, Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, for they had made an appointment together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. Some comfort. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, he was disfigured from scraping himself with a potsherd. They did not recognize him. They lifted their voices and wept, and each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head toward heaven. This is a way of, of, of showing your terrible suffering and affliction in antiquity. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him, for they saw that his grief was very great. 
So what has Job lost? He's lost all of his possessions. He lost all of his servants. He's lost all of his children. He's lost his health. He's lost the support of his wife. And his best friends become his accuser. accusers. But you know what really distresses Job is that apparently his best friend, God, has also forsaken him. Something that has greatly puzzled theologians as they've studied this book is that Satan, after chapter 2, appears to disappear from the book. You know, all of the main protagonists of the book reappear at the end of the book. But Satan, who caused all of this suffering and all of this grief, after chapter 2, appears to disappear from the story. And he gets off scot-free. And they say, this book is a travesty and justice. Because we don't know what happened to the guy who did all of this to Job. The fact is, we're going to find that Satan does not disappear from the book. He reappears at the end, but under a different name. So after chapter 2, did Job curse God? Did God, Job curse God? He did not. He remained faithful. And I can imagine after that second council that the heavenly beings say, Hallelujah! God is right! Job has lost everything, and yet he still fears God, shuns evil, and loves God in spite of everything going wrong. Now we need to understand, and I've repeated, I want to repeat this again. Job had incomplete knowledge. And as he suffers for a long period of time, he actually comes to believe that God is doing this to him. And he's puzzled. He cannot understand the reason why. It's inconceivable in the mind of Job that his best friend would actually do this to him. And throughout the book, he is tempted to throw in the towel and do exactly what the devil said that he should do. He's plagued with nagging questions and doubts because God seems to have forsaken him. In the rest of the book, he constantly speaks out to God. He says, God, please explain what's happening. Why have you turned against me? And God's answer is a deafening silence. You know, Job can tolerate the idea of losing all of his possessions and even his children and the support of his wife and his health and the support of his friends. But he cannot bear the thought of losing his best friend, God. Especially when he was a man of integrity. He can't understand what's happening. And he pleads with God for an audience. And God's answer, that is till chapter 38, is silence. Let's read some of those verses where Job is asking these questions of God. Notice Job chapter 16 in verses 11 to 14, he says, God hates me. I can't understand why. He's turned me over to the wicked. I can't understand why. Notice, God has delivered me to the ungodly and turned me over to the hands of the wicked. I was at ease, but he has shattered me. Notice, notice the number of times that he says God is doing this. He has shattered me. He also has taken me by, the, by my neck and shaken me to pieces. He has set me up for his target. His archers surround me. He pierces my heart and does not pity. He pours out my gall on the ground. He breaks me with wound upon wound. He runs at me like a warrior. What is his view of God? God has turned around and his friend has become his enemy and he cannot understand why. Job 16, verses 16 and 17 and also verse 20. 
Job says, my face is flushed from weeping, and my eyelids is the shadow of death. Although no violence is in my hands, and my prayer is pure. My friends scorn me, my eyes pour out tears to God. Job 19, verses 6 and 7 and verse 11. I'm only choosing certain verses in this section. I could have chosen many more about what's going on. Job 19, verses 6 and 7 and then verse 11. Job says, Know then that God has wronged me, and has surrounded me with His net. If I cry out concerning wrong, I am not heard. If I cry aloud, there is no justice. He has, that is God, He has also kindled His wrath against me. And He counts me as one of His enemies. His troops came together and build up their road against me. They encamp all around my tent. God has become my enemy, and I cannot understand it because I am his friend. Job 19, verses 9 through 11. Once again, we find the same feeling that Job has. Speaking about God, he says, He has stripped me of my glory and taken the crown from my head. He breaks me down on every side, and I am gone. My hope he has uprooted, he has uprooted like a tree. He has also kindled his wrath against me, and he counts me as one of his enemies. In Job 23, verses 3 through 5, Job says, Oh, if I could only find God wherever he is, I'd present my case before him. And I know that he would see the light. Notice Job 23, verses 3 through 5, Oh, that I knew where I might find him that I might come to his seat. I would present my case before him. See, this is, a, this is really a trial. I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. Praise the Lord that he didn't do that because there's no greater fool than the one who represents himself in a court of law. <laughs> what he didn't know is that God was representing him and God was defending him, even though it appeared that God wasn't. Verse 5, I would know the words which he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. And then he says in chapter 30, in verses 20 and 21, I cry out to God, and all I get is silence. I get no answer. Job 30, verses 20 and 21, I cry out to you, but you do not answer me. I stand up and you regard me, but you have become cruel to me. With the strength of your hand, you oppose me. Remember, Job did not have any written revelation. He didn't really have a clear view of what was happening behind the scenes. All he could see was that calamities were coming to his life, and he didn't know who was causing them. He thinks God has turned against him. Notice Job 39 through 13 tells us, actually, uh, let's just read verses 9 through 11. The nations make fun of Job. And now I am their taunting song. Yes, I am their byword. They abhor me. They keep far from me. They do not hesitate to spit in my face. Because he, that is God, has loosed my bowstring and afflicted me. They have cast off restraint before me. In other words, because God is doing this to me, they've cast off, off restraint and they do with me whatever they wish. In Job 31, verses 5 and 6, once again we find legal terminology. Here Job says, If I have walked with falsehood, or if my foot has hastened to deceit, let me be weighed on honest scales, that God may know my integrity. And in chapter 31, verse 35, Job cries out to God, please answer me. Job 31, 35, all oh, that I had one to hear me, here is my mark. All oh, that the Almighty would answer me, that my prosecutor had written a book. See the word prosecutor there. The book is saturated with legal terminology. This is a, this is a judgment that is taking place in heaven. 
And the case that is being examined is the case of Job. Now, not all of this uh, section of the book of Job, up to chapter 38, is negative. Job also has his moments of triumphal faith. He's saying, why God, why are you my enemy? Why don't you answer me? Why don't you hear me? But then he has moments where he says, oh, I know my Redeemer lives. <laughs> kind of like an ambivalent feeling, wanting to let go, but no, I'm not going to let go. Notice Job 13 and verse 15. Job 13, verse 15. He says, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Notice the, the idea of defending. In Job 14, verses 14 and 15, once again, this faith of Job comes out in the midst of trial and suffering. He asks the question, if a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard service I will wait till my change comes. This is when this mortal will be changed into immortality. And then he says, you shall call and I will answer you. You shall desire the work of your hands. In other words, you're going to desire me in that day. Job 19, verses 25 to 27, shows this triumphal faith of Job. Again, Job 19, verses 25 to 27, he says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. I know my Redeemer lives, and I know that in that day I will see Him. Job 23, once again, has these words of hope and courage. Job 23, and beginning with verse 8, Look, I go forward, but He is not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive Him. When He works on the left hand, I cannot behold Him. When he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. But he knows the way, I, the way I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. Verse 11. My foot has held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and, turned as, and not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandments of his lips. I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Was Job still faithful? Yes, he was. But asking questions, because he had incomplete knowledge. Let's not be too hard on Job. We have the Bible. He didn't. He didn't have all of the uh, biblical ideas about what happens in the world in consequence of the work of Satan. Finally, you come to chapter 38, and God has heard enough. <laughs> now God is going to tell Job, Job, now you be quiet. I'm going to ask the questions. Job 38 and verse 1. Finally, God breaks his silence. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, now listen carefully, who is this? who darkens counsel by words without knowledge. What was Job's problem? His words had no what? Knowledge. He says, now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. And you know, in chapters 38, 39, and 40, God asks Job over 60 questions. And the main question is, where were you, puny little man, when I laid the foundations of the earth? And if you read chapter 38 and 39, you're going to discover something very interesting. And that is that God describes creation week in its exact order. First, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth day. And he says to Job, Job, you're so intelligent. Where were you when I did all this? And as God describes his marvelous works of creation, 
at each instant, Job gets smaller and smaller and smaller. He says, now I realize that the universe does not revolve around me. <laughs> God is saying, Job, I have a cosmic mess on my hands. Who are you to question such a great God? And God ends with a very penetrating question, his series of questions in Job 40, verses 1 and 2. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Are you understanding the question? God is saying to Job, you know, uh, do you have any right to correct the Almighty? He who rebukes God, let him answer that question. And then Job answers God's question. And basically he says, you're right, and I'm wrong. You've made your point. Who am I to question what you do and what you allow? I'm just miserable, insignificant, small human being demanding answers from the king of the universe. And so Job says, you've made your point. I'm not going to speak again. Notice Job 30 and verse 3. Job 40 and verse 3. And we'll read through verse 5. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. That word vile really means insignificant. Vile in English means evil. But really, in the Hebrew, it means insignificant. I am insignificant. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I have spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. In other words, I am not going to speak anymore. And then in chapter, one, chapter 41, we reach the climax of the story of Job. Satan once again reappears. But at the end of the book, his name is not Satan, Satan. Satan means the adversary. But a different name is given to him. The name that is given to him is Leviathan. That's the same devil. Now I want you to notice several verses of chapter 41, and you tell me what Leviathan represents. See, Job has said to the Lord, you've made your point, you're great, I'm small, I'm a creature. I'm not going to ask any more questions. But God has a few more questions to ask Job. Notice Job 41 and verse 1. God says, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? What is God asking Job? He's saying, can you contend with Leviathan? Can you take him as your servant? Forever? Now who is this Leviathan? Obviously we're dealing with a symbol. Let's go to verses 18 to 21, and I hope you read this whole chapter, because the chapter is captivating. Job 41, verses 18 through 21. You know, some scholars think that this is a crocodile. This is no crocodile. Unless you've seen a, a fire-breathing crocodile. It says in verse 18, His sneezings flash forth, light, flash forth light, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lights. Sparks of fire shoot out. Smoke goes out of his nostrils as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. 
His breath kindles coals and a flame goes out of his mouth. This is a dragon, right? Notice verses 24 to 27 say that Leviathan is invincible. It says there in verse 24, his heart is as hard as stone. Oh, he has a stony heart. Even as hard as the lower millstone. When he raises himself up, the mighty are afraid. Because of his crashings, they are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches him, it cannot avail, nor does spear, dart, or javelin. He regards iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. Is this a powerful creature? It's a fire-breathing creature. And God says, Job, can you contend with Leviathan and defeat him? And of course, Job, Job would have known what Leviathan was because in his culture, it was believed that there was, there, that there was a creature which was called Lotan and also called Leviathan, which the gods had to fight against in order to be, be able to create the cosmos. So this was within his culture. He would understand that this represented the enemies of the God. In this case, the enemy of God. Notice chapter 41, 33, and 34 clearly identifies who this creature is. Job 41, verses 33 and 34. On earth there is nothing like him, God is speaking here, which is made without fear. He beholds, a better translation would be, he looks down on every high thing. He is king over all the children of pride. Who is king over the children of pride? The first one who was proud in the history of the universe. Who said, I will ascend to the heights and I will be like the most, God, most high. He who said, I am beautiful, I am all wise, I am all rich. Satan. Now allow me to read you a couple of passages from scripture that prove this. Isaiah 27 and verse 1. Isaiah 24, 25, 26 and 27 is known as the little book of Revelation in the Old Testament. Isaiah 27 and verse 1. In that day, the Lord with His severe sword, great and strong, will punish Leviathan. The fleeting what? Oh, the fleeting. What is Leviathan? The fleeting what? Serpent. Leviathan, that twisted serpent. And because the translators think that this is some type of crocodile, they translate, he will slay the reptile that is in the sea. Actually, the Greek word is dracon. And the King James translates the dragon. So this is the dragon and the serpent. Now, Revelation adds its testimony as to the identity of this being. You know what God is telling Job? God is telling Job, you want to know who's causing your problems? I have a big cosmic mess on my hands. It's Leviathan. And now, and now Job is going to understand. You're going to see it. Notice Revelation chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. Revelation 12, verses 7 through 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought, fought with the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven anymore or any longer. Now notice the terminology. So the great dragon was cast out, that what? That serpent of old, who is called the devil and Satan. What was the name that was given to this being at the beginning of the book of Job? Satan. First time in history that the name Satan appears. First time in scripture because Job was written first before anything else. So three names are given in this passage. Satan, the dragon, and the serpent. So who is Leviathan? Leviathan is a symbol of the devil. And it continues saying, called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, do you remember that Job said, I'm not going to talk anymore? I put my hand over my mouth, I'm going to shut up. 
Excuse the expression. But now Job feels like he has to talk again after God shows him Leviathan. He says, now I got it. Job 42 and verses 1 through 6. Listen carefully. The climax of the book. Job 42 verses 1 through 6. Then Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything. Including what? According to the context. Including what? You can defeat whom? Leviathan. I know you can do everything. And that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Now listen carefully. Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. What was the problem with Job? Lack of knowledge, understanding, information. He didn't have scripture. He thought it was God. And who was it? Leviathan, Satan. Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said I will question you and you shall answer me. And now listen. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear. But now my eye sees you. In other words, now I understand you. Do you think the heavenly universe is watching this? What view are they getting of God? Ah, this is the good God. What vision are they getting of Satan? Wicked, evil, destroyer. The whole universe has seen the difference between God and the enemy of God. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. In other words, he's saying, I am sorry I ever questioned you. Did Job ever curse God? Never! Because the Bible says that God gave to him twice as much as what he had before. God would not have rewarded him if he had cursed God. And so the heavenly universe says, God is right. And Satan is wrong. Now listen carefully. This story is going to be repeated in the end time. During the time of trouble such as never has been seen in the history of the world. The Bible tells us that the beholding universe will see on this earth an entire generation of human beings who love God so much that they will be willing to die rather than give up their trust in God. The Bible tells us that the devil will take everything from God's people. He will take their possessions. He will take away their health. He will have them thrown into prison. He will turn their families against them. Their friends will abandon them. They will have no earthly support. And yet because they have the experience of Job, and other experiences in the Bible, they will say like Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. In fact, Job 23 verse 10, Job understood, he says, but he knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come forth as gold. You remember the story of the three young men who were thrown into the fiery furnace? Did they prize their relationship with God more than they prized their life? They did. It was a matter of loyalty to God, no matter what. And they were willing to give up their life in order to be loyal to God. You know, when they stood before King Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar says, you know, if you don't bow before the image and worship it, one sentence is for you, you'll be thrown into the fiery furnace, and what God will be able to deliver you from my, my hands? And they say, God will be able to deliver us, and we will not worship your image that you have raised up. And so Nebuchadnezzar has the furnace heated seven times worse than ever before. I believe that that, rep that represents the period of the seven last plagues, the great tribulation. 
and they're thrown into the fiery furnace. They loved God so much they were willing to die. The universe was watching what was happening. And then, of course, you know how the story develops? They're in the fire, and they're walking around like they're in a garden. <laughs> the only thing that burnt up were, the, were, were the, the, the ropes with which they were tied. And Nebuchadnezzar sees a fourth man in the furnace and says, Did we not cast three? I see four. And they're walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not burned. And then Nebuchadnezzar says, Sadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Abednego, come out! The Bible, my, when da, God delivers, He delivers really, because not even a hair from their heads was burnt off. They didn't even smell like smoke. The Bible says that. Did God revert, reward His servants? Did He spare them the trial? He did not spare them the trial. He delivered them in the midst of trial. Which is different than when many are teaching today, they're saying, oh no, the church will be raptured to heaven, and the, and, and the tribulation, that's for the Jews. And they'll be found in the midst of the tribulation without any refuge, because they have not made any preparation beforehand. Do you know the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 33, that it's the righteous that will be able to live with the everlasting fire? I read this in a previous lecture. Do you know why? Because they have a fireproof character. <laughs> the fire of God does not consume them. Now the wicked, the fire is going to consume them in an instant. They're not going to burn forever and ever. The fire will consume them and that's it. But God's people will be able to live in the presence of a holy God. In the midst of the fire that consumes. Because they have loved God more than life itself.